So Fred, could you speak a little bit more? You've done work on computational methods for membrane proteins in vesicles. How, how was that done? And is there any information loss considerations if you're trying to subtract out a membrane when doing the processing? Yeah, so the, um, the, the problem with membrane proteins in liposomes is that there's a, a really strong signal from the liposome membrane itself. Um, this can be gotten around by a couple of ways. If you have a really big protein, like say the ryanidine receptor, um, you don't have to exactly. worry about the liposome membrane because <laughs> the, uh, there's so much signal from the protein. Um, for a small protein, uh, you have to do some kind of signal subtraction. Otherwise, the, this really strong curved membrane sort of overpowers the, the, uh, the alignment. So basically, you have to remove that signal enough so that it doesn't interfere with um, uh, orientation determination. So what, so, so what we did was we sort of made a physical model of a spherical, uh, spherical uh, liposome and we, we fit, that to, uh, fit that to each liposome on a micrograph and subtract that. Hi, Dr. Sigworth. I have a follow-up question on that. So if I have something that's very small relative to the size of my protein that has very strong signal, such as my protein binds an iron sulfur cluster, would the process be similar where I just have a model of it and I do a signal subtraction or are there different considerations for that? Wait, you're trying to subtract away which, the iron sulfur cluster? Just, I guess, I was going to ask anyways, how something that gives a very strong signal compared to your protein would affect the data processing. And in your example, I guess the liposome is very, very large. And are there different considerations for something that gives a strong signal, but is much smaller? I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah. I mean, if it's a rigidly, if, if, it's, if it's part of the protein that is always in the, is always in the same place, um, it probably helped alignment uh, to leave it in. I don't know. I see. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. And uh, to follow up on the liposomes, actually the neural networks are fantastic for picking particles in liposomes because you can actually train them to look for your particles within the liposome instead of everywhere else. And so um, just by basically retraining one of those neural networks, we could, for example, pick ranadine receptor out of liposomes quite easily, whereas Without retraining, with, with, without retraining uh, the, the global model actually would try to avoid liposomes and never pick them. And so that's yeah. actually a good example where the neural network can be quite useful. That's cool. I'll have to try that. <laughs> so I might have missed this, but um, can, what, what is the difference between local refinement, heterogeneous refinement, 3D classification, and what are the best uses, or, or when would you apply each of those uses? Um, they are all different names for a similar thing, um, or for the same thing. Uh, because in your classification, in your 3D classification, you need to refine the angular orientation of your particles. Therefore, you do both at the same time. Um, the question then is, do you, do you refine them globally, like looking at every possible orientation, uh, which is what Kreuzberg does, and which Reland can do as well if you don't constrain um, the angular search range. Um, and so local classification would just be when you just constrain that, that search range to a, a smaller value usually because you're interested in one part of the protein and therefore you're masking it and so therefore and, and, and you want to realign everybody and classify or classify or realign or both uh, to that one little part of of interest um, yes uh, does that answer all your questions 
Because your question was, yeah, does that, or is there still something that... I, uh, I think I'm still trying to wrap my head around the, the masking component and the local refinement and what piece is being aligned and what piece is blind or is sort of subtracted out of the algorithm. Yeah, so when you mask, often people say I'm masking that one subunit, subunit one, which means that you're actually keeping subunit one and masking out everything else. Um, so, so it's kind of in, in reverse. So basically what you do is you have a mask around subunit one where the mask is basically a 3D volume where is one values, value of one around subunit one and value of zero everywhere else and a, a, a smooth fall off of a few pixels to not introduce artifacts. Um, yeah, so that's what it is, and therefore the program after that only look at, looks at that. So you, it, it can only align that part of your protein. Everything else is not visible, and therefore it will basically um, concentrate its alignment on that and the classification as well at the same time. Um, if the portion you're masking is too small, basically below 40 KD usually, you can't align anymore accurately, and therefore, if you were to align, it would drift, drift off. Um, you might still be able to classify, although I'm not too sure about that, uh, by keeping, by not aligning, only classifying with fixed alignment. That's something you can do in some cases, which often gives very weird results. So you need to be very careful about it, but you can actually try to do, to do that for very small bits and pieces. I wanted to talk a little bit about initial models because I think um, it's pretty popular for people to go and ask Reliant or CryoSpark to give them an initial model. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about how that works. Um, so <coughs> um, the, the big problem with all of the refinement algorithms is that they can get trapped in a local optimum. Um, so, Inter the uh, the uh, maximum likelihood algorithms are much better in this respect, but they're not perfect. So um, uh, Reliance initial model uh, algorithm, and I think uh, CryoSpark is similar, is to do the do a noisy integration. <laughs> that is, um, you um, you uh, do these iterations around this uh, EM loop, but in each iteration, you only use a subset of your particle images. And what that does is it, it makes the, um, the estimate of the volume sort of hop around in its high dimensional space. And uh, so it's less likely to settle into a, um, into a false optimum. So it's this stochastic integration that, um, uh, that prevents that. Thank you for pointing out an, an important omission of mine. <laughs> it was not all about the detectors. <laughs> Any other questions? Areas we want to discuss? So I kind of skipped your question, which was the resolution. We kind of what? Wait. So you are mentioning about the parameter in Reliant, like to adjust, uh, because there's a parameter like in the uh, expectation steps, you can adjust your resolution, right? You mentioned adjust this parameter can like have some difference on your structures, like how exactly it looks like you expect more on that. Uh, you're talking about the alignment uh, resolution? Yeah, like you are mentioning about like zero parameter or resolution. So I assume that like yeah. it is the alignment uh, of the resolution in in specific resolutions, right? Is that the parameter you are talking about? Okay, so I, if I understand correctly, you're asking me about this parameter we can play with in Reliant or CryoSpark, which is the 
maximum alignment resolution. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So, what's the what's the like effect you have seen on playing with this parameters? Like, how it looks like. So, I'll give you one example, which actually I have um, still haven't published, which was but which which was quite striking, um, where for a a ribosome translation initiation complex, which has many, many factors. Uh, if you don't limit the resolution, basically a classification with, let's say, 10 classes would get me one volume, which is a ribosome. Actually, th that part is published. Um, where And the rest is junk. And so that's, we have that in our, uh, an early paper in 2013 and we looked at translation initiation for the first time. And so that allowed us to sort out lots of crap and kind of get, get the, one, the, the one volume that actually was good and, and it was our structure. Uh, and so in that case, you're really funneling very, very fast. So you really get a fast funnel where Reliant at every iteration improves the resolution, like basically improves the alignment of the particles and therefore also improves the resolution of the references. And it will basically, very quickly in that process, it will pick the, re the reference that has the highest resolution, therefore the lar largest amount of signal at high resolution as a preferred one. And so all your particles that align well at high resolution to that one, they all go to that one reference. And all the other references that might have different conformations different factors bound and everything else get forgotten about because they are lower resolution and Reliant is basically, it's like you can think of the 3D Fourier transform is much, has much more space at high resolution than it has at low resolution. And it looks like Reliant doesn't weigh those two things very differently, at least for classification. Therefore, everything goes to the high resolution signal and you end up with one high resolution reconstruction and everything else is either garbage or has to be massively different to actually kind of converge towards a two-state solution kind of thing. Um, and so when you limit the resolution, you're basically hiding all the high resolution data in the Fourier transform. As a result, the particles will only focus on the low resolution data and the presence or an absence of a domain, for example, that's a 20 angstrom question. It's like, you don't need much resolution to tell this domain is present or is not present, or this domain is here and is moved here, or it's, it's changed position. So for the position of a domain, you don't need more than 15, 20 angstrom resolution. Um, and therefore, when I redid the classification, this time with basically 20 angstrom limit on the alignment. Now I ended up with 10 classes, all ribosomes, all different. Uh, because basically, yeah, from one class at high res, I've become, I have now 10 classes where I have this factor present, this factor not present, this other factor here, this factor moved around from here to here. Uh, the head of the ribosome tilted left, tilted right, all sorts of differences that could be further classified actually. Uh, and so I had basically 25 different conformation and, uh, in, in my thing, which were not sh showing up in that first initial classification. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, so that's one kind of, that was one good example. So, any bad example? Well, a bad example would be that you, you filter at 20 angstrom resolution and your particles no longer have enough data to align properly and you end up with just completely garbage results. Um, and that's, yeah. Actually, I, I had an example of that for a piece of a GPCR. Uh, just last week where I said, oh, try at 20. Oh, okay, let's try 12. <laughs> oh, 12 works, good. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing your stories. Yep.
Microphone. So in 2D classification, how does how does the software choose the reference for the purpose of alignment? Say that again. Uh, in 2D classification, how does the software choose the reference for the purpose of alignment? I, I think I can answer that. Sure, go ahead. Um, so the, uh, uh, yeah, the 2D classification um, has much less of a um, uh, local optimum problem. So I think what Reliant does is it, is it just makes random subsets of the original images and adds them together and uh, makes the various initial um, models just be random, um, uh, random particle images added together. Thank you. And here again, fixing the resolution to a given level will change the how Reliant basically uh, sort out your particles. Um, and so you'll have very different results if you filter it. And with, in 2D, it's fast. You can actually, you can play with that and see at what, sorry, at what stage does your alignment break down. Um, so you can try a, a 2D classification at 30 angstrom, 20, 15, and looking at how, how different the results are. Thank you for putting this out on a day. So I just pulled up the Reliant GUI and saw where you could set that. I never tried it. Okay, so uh, I'll ask one last question for you, Fred, before we let you go. So resolution is a common criteria for classification and sorting. So let's say you've already used resolution as a criteria and there's the rest. What's the rest? And you know the rest by orthogonal methods must be your macromolecule of interest. What methods would you go to start interrogating that? And how much confidence would you have in that if there's also grid to grid variance, et cetera? So let's say you're trying to analyze what else is in the tube, as it were. Oh my goodness, I'll let, I think I'll let I'm going to answer that. So, um, so this is a really great trick to limit the resolution so that you're comparing things at low resolution. What else? Well, you know. 3D classification is, of course, the most powerful because it requires um, the various 2D parts of it to be self-consistent to make a 3D volume. So let's talk about 3D classification. And then the second thing is, well, you know, you can try all kinds of different 3D models, um, you know, blobs, ellipsoids, um, you know, things to pick up dirt particles or things a little bit different. Um, so that that's what I would do is I would uh, is, is I would play with uh, different initial 3D references, which I guess I have to do in CrowdSpark because Reliant does handle multiple references well. So then, before we wrap up, Alan A or Fred, any last words? Well, I, we didn't cover any of the machine learning algorithms to classify data, not based on basically uh, alignment to a reference. Um, and so I guess that's something to keep an eye on. There's, there's, a, few, there's a few programs that are being developed, uh, manifold embedding, CryoDragon, Roam, um, and I'm forgetting a few others. Um, and so, yeah, that's something where people might want to play with, uh, but that are still very much in development phase. And I think Fred probably has, can, can say a lot about that too. Well, let, let, let me just talk a moment about the problem because um, it's, uh, it, it, it's kind of amazing and in fact scandalous that, uh, that this 2D and, class, 2D and 3D classification work because the, uh, the underlying model is to say, um, I have a data set where I have um, a few discrete kinds of particles. And in that case, the, the theory says, yes, you can find out, you can, get, you can get the structure of each of these discrete classes. But if you have something continuous, 
you know, some continuous variation in the conformation of your particle, then, um, then classification is going to give you, it is, it's not guaranteed to give you the right answer. Or if you have um, various kinds of dirt in your particle set, there's no guarantee that classification gives you the right answer. So it's actually kind of, uh, we're really fortunate that you can throw your horrible data set into 2D or 3D classification actually get something reasonable out of it. Uh, your horrible, that is in contaminated data set. And it will and not. Maybe, and maybe, yeah, and maybe machine learning will, will uh, fill in this gap. Yeah, for example, there's, there, are, there are types of noise or types of dirt, or I, I don't know what they are which in um, that we could actually sort out with machine learning and that we are completely oblivious, oblivious to rely on, for example. So um, in, in the case where we used manifold embedding on the Ryden receptor, uh, there was basically about one third of the data, which just showed a difference in contrast in the particle, some kind of, I don't know if it was an expansion or uh, a, blur, a blurring or something. Um, and that was one third of the particle that we could actually get, that had nothing to do with conformational variability and that we could get rid of, um, that were basically visible in this manifold uh, method that had not been picked up whatsoever in, in Reliant. Um, and so these algorithms might at some point actually be the, very powerful at it's making the difference between real stuff and, and junk, um, or they might be very sensitive to it, and actually that might throw them off, meaning that if you have junk within your data, basically you just can't get a reasonable answer. Um, so yeah, that's still very much work in progress. And, and one thing that would be beautiful, which is, so currently, for example, for manifold embedding, you first align your particles in Reliant. And once you've aligned them, you break them down into bins and you look at basically the uh, conformational landscape in each orientation separately. And you're lucky that you can actually get them all back together at the end of that. Uh, but what would really be beautiful is if you could figure out both orientation and conformation together in one sort of continuum where you're not trying to separate any of those things. They're all part of the same problem. Like when a, when a domain moves in a protein, it affects the alignment of those particles. And so being able to actually integrate alignment and classification, or it's no longer classification actually, uh, this basically description uh, of the alignment and of the conformational heterogeneity in one go, um, that would be quite quite powerful. Um, in, in many cases. Um, now, for the specific case of manifold embedding, it does not work. Um, it's like, it's very, very hard to figure out um, basically where we are in 3D space, basically um, within, the, within that manifold. Um, and so the, the orientations cannot, in, in theory, can be recovered in practice or not. And that's why the it's done in, in two stages. For Cry Dragon and, and other algorithms like this one, uh, I think you also need to align your particles. Uh, if I'm correct, I haven't used them yet, so I, I need to start playing with that. There's, a, there's an interesting um, sort of theoretical um, take on this, and that is um, there is a, um, there's an amazing theorem called the a, a, um, Fourier slice theorem for covariances, which means that if you if you process your data in the right way, you can find out principal component variations in the three D volume that come out of your data set directly. So I think this is um, this is uh, CryoSpark uh, does this kind of estimation of eigen eigen volumes. Um, which is 
which is sort of interesting. And, you know, there's hope that someday you could estimate eigenvolumes at high resolution, in which case you can say, well, I have my basic particle and then, um, and then I add a certain amount of this principal component to it and uh, get a high resolution new reconstruction. It's kind of, CryoDragon is sort of doing that. Uh, so anyway, so that's interesting bit of theory, but to see how, how it pans out. Manifold embed embedding, what is that actually? What is manifold embedding? What is manifold embedding? Fred, do you want to give it a first crack? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me <laughs> Let me because I, I, I can only botch it. So. <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, um, uh, we, have, uh, we have volumes that have, say, a million voxels. And uh, what you can do is say, well, any, uh, any given volume is one point in a one million dimensional space, right? So depending on the coordinates of your point, that defines all of the values in your, in your density map. If you, um, uh, if you rotate your particle, that, um, that traces out a, just a single curve in your high dimensional space, or if you, include all three Euler angles that, that, that produces a two-dimensional surface in this high dimensional space. And this, uh, this surface is called the manifold. And if you have then another kind of particle there, you get another, uh, another manifold, another one of these two-dimensional surfaces. So manifold embedding, the, the whole trick, which is the whole trick in all kinds of bioinformatics these days is to say, I have this incredibly high dimensional data set, but there are only a couple dimensions that I really care about. So I'm gonna reduce my million dimensional data set down to you know, just a couple dimensions. And, um, and one of those dimensions could be you know, a conformational chain. So you, so you use uh, one of these several algorithms that throw out all of the uninteresting um, coordinates and remap the coordinates onto some low dimensional space. I hope you like that. And so, yeah, so some dimensions are the orientation of your particle might be a dimension, uh, conformational changes. So let's say in, in a particle you have maybe one, two or three major conformational modes of motions. And so, one of those uh, spaces will be one of those conformational motions. Another one might be a different conformational motion. And so you might be able to map, for example, two or three conformational motions, um, um, basically one with the other one. And if you do that, you basically get what we call a, an energy landscape. And, and you can actually, with those programs, you can, you can say, okay, within that landscape, um, also what's the population? So how many particles do I have in this part of, um, uh, of the landscape, which how many particles do I have in that other part? Um, and that basically gives you an energy landscape because the number of particles in one area of that multidimensional space means this is a local minimum in terms of energy. Um, and so you can basically retrieve thanks to that because you're not binning into five classes, you're keeping everything as basically one large multidimensional surface. Um, you can basically navigate that surface and just look at populations there and, and look at conformations as well. Um, and so you can basically retrieve in some ways, thanks to that you can retrieve the 3D conformational changes going uh, that your particle can can take. Okay, let's thank Fred and Amade.